morning. I want to encourage you guys in the back. We got all these empty chairs in these three rows right here. And I do this every time. If I could get you guys in the back to move forward a little bit. There we go. Whoever gets up and moves, you guys can ask any question you want. Whoever's back there, I don't even see you. So come on up. It is like this row right here is almost completely open. How's the uh, parfait? It's good. How's the food? By the way, you should never offer me. If you take a look at me, I never turn down food. I know this is a workshop in language. I will tell you my favorite word in English is buffet. <laughs> and I absolutely live it. So how many of you have been to one of these before? Raise your hands if you've been to one. Raise your hands if you've never seen me speak before. I give you credit for being willing to sit in the front row. Uh, this is meant to be interactive. And I'm going to actually be asking you a few questions as we go through it. But I want to acknowledge, I had a whole bunch of people. Was anyone at my house, anyone here at my house last night? Raise your hands. So it was a little bit more stressful than I wanted it to be. It is so dangerous to engage in a political or policy conversation now. And it's because it's not actually a conversation. It is, it is much more, I want to speak, and you need to listen. And if you think about how many people said, no, I'm going to talk, or how many people said, you need to know, that is the most aggressive, most in-your-face type of communication. And frankly, it's tragic. This used to be, America used to be the place where you could go and have the most incredible debates. I'm going to date myself, because this is actually before my time. But Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley, the intellect back then, or, or uh, George Will uh, on the right, and there were so many people on the left, the, the Pollard, Mario Cuomo, Ted Kennedy, and now we've become mean. And so what I'm going to try to do in this session is give you language that transcends ideology, give you language that helps you in business, in public policy, in entertainment, and I'm going to try to make it useful. And I have to begin, because they did say to me, no political jokes. So everything that I say to you is actually true. For example, did you know that all three of Donald Trump's wives are immigrants? True story. It's just proof that there are some jobs only an immigrant will take. <laughs> or the fact that I had the guts, it was the White House Christmas party, and I actually had the guts. By the way, I can't wear pink, but it looks really good on you. I do it every single time. I had to ask the president, what does the J and Donald J. Trump stand for? You know what he told me? Genius. So let's pull this up, and I'm going to answer any questions you have. I've got microphones, we've got runners. I want to make this useful to you. So let's get started. Look at what happens. This is eight years. I mean, he looks like almost like a different person. And by the way, think of how much George W. Bush accomplished when English was only his second language. <laughs> He's not the only one who aged. Again. Eight years, but no elected official aged as much as this guy. <laughs> Bernie Sanders, I gotta be careful of that. Bernie Sanders is so old, by the way, the cops just came. Thank you, sir, for your service. I want you to know I left my pot outside. Bernie Sanders is so old, it takes him an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes. He's so old, his favorite painting is The Last Supper. He's a second waiter from the left. Sanders is so old, the only time he doesn't have to pee is when he's peeing. So we came up with a slogan, and I want to know what you think about it, because I wanted to work for him. I really didn't want to volunteer. What do you think of this? I said, they said no jokes. I wanted to be Secretary of Agriculture in a Sanders administration so that I could plant the magic trees where all that free shit grows from. 
No, not good? By the way, I'm looking at a woman who looks just like my mom, and I feel so awful for using the word shit, so I apologize to everyone. We've never been this divided before. We've never been this angry before. We asked a very simple question. Is this the most divided that we have been in your lifetime? Among 18 to 29 year olds, it's in the 70 percentile. Look at it for those who are 87, um, for those 65 and above. And these are people who lived through Bobby Kennedy's assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination. These are people who lived through Vietnam and Watergate and oil embargoes. And yet they say it's worse now. And if you believe it's that bad, then you behave differently. I was taught to ask questions. And remember, I need your contact information. I was taught in my life to ask questions. And for those of you taking notes, the most important thing you can do for communication to transcend this politics and ideology is ask a question. The idea of a rhetorical question, how can we be a great country if we don't have great schools? How can America possibly succeed when we don't invest in the future? That's a rhetorical question. It has an answer that we all basically agree on. And we don't do that enough. We make statements, we make declarations. And I'm telling people now in my speech writing, the opening statement should be a question. And to make it even better, I have people raise their hands. So I want, I'm just curious here, by the way, because we're going to get to it in a moment. In this debate, Capitalism versus socialism. Or you can say neither. Who here would say capitalism for you? Keep your hands up, and hopefully you can get that in the video. Okay, who says socialism? One guy, right there. Sir, your social security number is? <laughs> I give you credit for having the courage. We will beat the hell out of you when this is done. Although this is Milken, so we will pay people to beat you up. <laughs> and who says neither? I have to take my badge off. Yeah, but how am I going to know what my name is? OK, I do the jokes here. <laughs> uh, put the division thing back up. The second thing to do is to acknowledge the concern, or acknowledge the opposition, or acknowledge the challenges that face there, that face us. And it's interesting because the phrase, I get it, is really powerful right now, particularly early in communication. You're angry with Donald Trump? I get it. You think the Democrats have moved so far to the left? I get it. You have to acknowledge people's concern. You have to acknowledge their frustration. And you guys coming in, there are tons of empty seats. In the, it's like it's filled back there, but there are empty seats up here. So I actually encourage you guys to move up. And where's Con oh, Conrad? Where are you? The room actually filled. I'm, I'm surprised. What the hell are you doing here at 845? I don't know what I'm doing here at 845. So it's not just about division. It's also the number of people who have stopped talking to each other because we disagree with each other. And this frightens me. I've met probably half of you in this room, and if you disagree with me, I want to talk to you. It's if you agree with me, I don't care. Because I'm not going to learn something from someone who agrees with me. Look, if half of 18 to 29 year olds themselves have stopped talking to someone because they don't like their politics. Once again, that is not typical of this country, and it is tragic. So I want to give you some level setting. This is all from data that we finished on Saturday of last week. Two, uh, almost two-thirds no longer agree. Only, and let me rephrase that, only 62% agree with something that's at the core of America, which is if you work hard and you play by the rules, you can succeed. 62%. That question has been asked in polling since the late 1960s. It has never been that low. We've never had the feeling that just maybe we can't succeed no matter what our efforts are. The one that bothers me even more, the system in America is rigged, two-thirds. And I have to tell you something. When I saw about the, uh, the education scandal, that people were paying for their kids to get admitted to schools, 
I want those actresses, um, wherever the camera is, I want you to go to jail. How dare you bust up a system knowing the damage that that's going to do to the credibility of this country? I'll tell you, for the people in this room, you're, you're in the top 1%. Virtually everyone in this room is in the top 1%. Half of you are in the top one-tenth of 1%. Do you want to know why Americans now resent you? It's because they feel that you don't play by the rules. They feel that you use lobbyists and lawyers and loopholes, three L's. Lobbyists, lawyers, and loopholes to take advantage in ways that nobody else has. And that education scandal is the worst because now you're playing with the next generation. It's bad enough that they feel that you don't pay your taxes, and they do. But what's even worse is if they think that you use unfair leverage to help your children at the expense of theirs. By the way, I want this to be interactive, so I'm going to show you a couple more slides, and I'm going to actually stop for questions or encourage you to do so. This is the first language, and I'm going to, I'm going to do about half a dozen of these words, and then I'll stop and take questions from you. Imagine is the most powerful word in the English language. If I ask you to imagine life at perfection, there are now almost 200 people here. Each one of you will have a different thought, a different visual in your head. The word imagine allows you to communicate in the perspective of the person you're trying to reach. And it is powerful because it is no longer my vision or my language. It now becomes yours. So I urge you, imagine if you want to bring people together, if you want to challenge them to do something incredible for the future, Imagine is the most powerful word. Peace of mind. Stop using the phrase security because security means that there's a threat out there. It means that you need uh, a fence or an armed guard or just something because it's not right. Peace of mind is a higher value. You can close your eyes and everything is fine. You ask people which would they rather have? They'd rather have peace of mind. More efficient and effective. How many of you do public policy here in some way that you're pushing policy? What the public is, this is for you all, what the public is looking for is more efficient, more effective, and more accountable. More efficient, that you can show them that you do more with less. More effective in that you actually do what you commit to do. And more accountable, which means if you fail to do it, you're held responsible for it. More efficient, more effective, more accountable. We want it from philanthropies. We want it from government. We want it from the people in charge. Very powerful phrase. That last one, a meaningful, measurable track record of success. Where are my hedge fund and VC people? Raise your hands. Wow, all the finance people must be at a different panel. That's what they're looking for. You want to know who's going to invest in you? Who's going to write you a check? You show them that you have a meaningful, measurable and by the way that alliteration is really powerful in the letter that i wrote for you there were several different examples when i want to have impact i'm going to use words that sound the same and i'm going to put them in pairs or or three because that ensures to me that people are going to remember it and by the way and i feel sorry for the people in the front words that begin with b's p's and t's words that make you spit when you say them are words that people remember. You want to be really strong? That's how you do it. You spit on someone, they won't, forget, they won't forget you spit on them, and they won't forget the language. And if you want to be gentle and kind, it's words that have the S sound to it. It's not just what the words mean, it's also what the words sound are really powerful. Couple, couple more here. You're in control. Now that doesn't mean that they want to exercise control. And can I acknowledge a mistake with you all? And I've started to do this now. I do a lot of teaching at NYU Abu Dhabi. And when this thing is done, if everybody's here, I'm going to bring the students up. This is really impressive at the very end. If you use language like one, one people, one mission, one purpose, what do people think? That I have to compromise. I have to give up something of mine so that it's one of theirs. If it's one people, well, yes, I'm included, but I'm still compromising. Together allows you to be an individual. Together allows you to join without giving something up. 
The word together is twice as powerful as the word one because it allows people to be individual rather than having to be part of something else. And I'll do one more up here. Okay, the negative. The consequences of failure. I learned this from George W. Bush's speech in Iraq. Everybody wanted America out. Everybody said the policy had failed. But what they were even more afraid was leaving and the consequences of failure. They opposed the policy, but they agreed when he used that word, the consequences of leaving, they still opposed the policy, but they thought that getting out and what would happen, the consequence of what would happen, would be worse than the consequence of remaining in and actually accelerating what the government was trying to do. So these are your 21 words. There's a lot more up here that I could, oh, you know what, I gotta do one more. Fact-based, not evidence-based. Who are my lawyers here? You look so nice to be a lawyer. <laughs> the reason why I love Dick Cheney, he could have shot the dog, he could have shot the truck, but he shot the lawyer. <laughs> in the face. And he got the lawyer to apologize for being shot in the face. I mean, that's good communication. If I use evidence base, and this is something that Hillary Clinton did, and by the way, we, I'll do anything on politics you wanna do, I'll do anything on corporate you wanna talk about, I'm gonna go to Q&A in one second, she always talked about evidence-based politics or evidence-based science, evidence-based research. Here's the problem. There's evidence for the prosecution and evidence for the defense. A fact is a fact. And there's no argument over a fact. There is argument over evidence. And I'm shocked all the time that people don't pay closer attention to how people hear these words, to what these words actually mean to the recipient. So they say them because it sounds good to them but it doesn't sound good to the audience. So what can I answer for you? Let me stop for a second, put those words up so people can take, and you'll get the first question. And by the way, tell me what state you're from. California. I'm from California. So my question is... So you realize the damage that you've done to the rest of America? You owe us all an apology. I'm waiting. <laughs> well, I spent the last... Next question. <laughs> Go ahead. So the statistics you have on how people feel about the divide in the country, do those hold consistent across different regions of the country? Good. It's a good question. We are the most divided on the Pacific states, Washington, Oregon, California, and most divided between Boston and Washington. The closer you are to politics and public policy, the more divided we are. The further you are away, the least divided are our southern states. And by the way, the greatest divisions are coming in states that Democrats have the majority, and the least amount of divisions are in states where Republicans have the majority. And there's a message in that. What else? Yes, right here. Uh, and I, I'll give you the mic. Really? It's only because I keep turning my head. Uh, where are you from? Uh, from California. Is anyone here not from California? Go ahead. Go ahead. My question is that you had talked about how words divide people uh, because they're talking less. Are they reading more? And if that's so, then what's the, what's the problem? Because I'm seeing it as when you're reading it, you're all debating in different silos and nobody's really talking to each other. Well, the problem to me is social media. The problem to me, frankly, in a word is Twitter. And I believe that Twitter's done more damage to the democracy in this country and more damage to reputations undeservedly because how can you communicate ideas of substance in so few characters? It rewards brevity and it rewards aggressiveness. A negative tweet is so much more likely to be retweeted, so much more likely than something positive. And the problem is you are rewarded if you are snarky and mean as you can be on Twitter, you become famous and you get lots of followers. If it's all about love and respect and kumbaya, nobody cares. And I would love to see politicians make an announcement. I want them to communicate via Twitter, but I'd love to see a candidate for president who says, I will not send a negative tweet. 
Judge me not just by what I say, but by what I write on social media. I think that would have a positive impact. And by the way, I'm waiting for a candidate to buy a full page ad in some newspaper saying I will run a completely positive campaign. There are 18 candidates running for the Democratic nomination right now. One of them will distinguish themselves by saying enough is enough in this negativity. I'm not going to respond to Donald Trump. I'm not going to respond to Maxine Waters. I'm not going to respond to any of that. Judge me by how positive I am. I'm waiting for that to happen. Hold on. Ticket to losing, though, if you don't respond to Donald Trump, you're basically dead. I mean, he killed all the Republican candidates in 2016 because not a lot of them would go after him. And it just strikes me that you know Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign slogan "Used Together." Trump's was all security wall, everything that works. Like, what's the argument for doing what you say when the opposite is what actually works? So you will not be surprised, but the gentleman who made that comment is from the media, and he gets his clicks with conflict. He gets his clicks with really rough headlines. And the nastier you are, the more likely people are to read it. I do a lot of work in sports. And I will occasionally work for managers and coaches. They don't watch cable news. So I can sit in their press conferences and they don't know who I am. And I'm listening to the press guys. And they said, yeah, I wrote a great thing about this coach. I got 200 clicks. I trashed him the next day and I got 2,000. I'm not exaggerating. These are the actual numbers that was happening in the conversation. So I get why you want them to fight with each other. I don't want them to, but I mean, it's effective. Here you go. I, I'm not advocating that they fight with each other, but I'm just talking about what is effective in political campaigns. I mean, everything you've described, what you want in a politician, is the opposite of what Donald Trump has been doing, and he's been actually quite successful with it. So I, I'm not advocating for you know, the media's role in this. I'm not or talking about politician's role in this, particularly the one who is the President of the United States right now. Hey, there's room right up in the front. You can stretch your legs. So my answer to that is math. If I have 18 candidates and 17 of them are pounding the crap out of each other, and I'm the one person who gets up on stage and says, this is, America is divided, America is polarized. We are doing damage to the political process. We're doing damage to the democracy. Yes, I oppose Donald Trump, and I wish you to vote for me. But I will win this nomination by talking about what's right and not by trashing my opponents. I will win this nomination by telling you what I am for, not what they are against. And I will win this nomination and actually deserve the role of President of the United States. Who would like that? Raise your hands. Turn around. So you're writing stuff. Record that. Because all that you guys do, and I have a decent relationship with Politico, but all that you guys do is you pound the crap out of each other every day. No, that's what you guys do. I blame the politicians. I blame the media. I blame people like me. I'll take responsibility for it. Take responsibility. What else? We'll do one more, and then I'm going to show you more stuff. Heather, uh, if you can run it back to her. By the way, she was my boss at the Kennedy School, the single best three months of my entire life. And I apologize for the NYU Abu Dhabi kids. The single best time in my life was when I was a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard. And I don't think I ever drank as much as I did with those students. <laughs> and I'm going to acknowledge, even though you're filming this, that I know some of them are not of age, but screw it, it was fun. Yeah, and, and you are still remembered there. You are awesome. As is always the case, there are 4,000 questions I have for you. But I'm hung up on what you're saying about fact-based. What do we do about facts in the world of alternative facts? How, how do we make sense of and make facts matter again. Because we have to, you, and I believe that you begin a presentation. And by the way, you, I'm going to give you another point for those taking notes. If you want to prove your point, you need three facts. One of them is random. Two facts is a trend. But you haven't proven it until you have three. And when you present three, and there are statistics, there are information, and the key to this is it's verifiable. 
What I've now told people to do, and I know we got some science people, by the way, these, you're more likely to, f there's only like three or four seats left, but there are a couple up here. You name the study, you name the year, and we have to do it now, because otherwise people won't believe it. But you provide that kind of backup information, they may not publish it, but when you're speaking it, you will be trusted. So I'm gonna show you polling data in a minute, if I did it, it has no name because it's me. If I didn't do it, I put the name of the poll, I put the margin of error, and I put the date of the survey. That's how you emphasize that this should be trusted. You are correct, and it frightens me, and I don't believe in alternative facts. That's one of my disappointments with this administration. And I also think we have to speak truth to power, which means if I'm sometimes seen as being on one side, I have to be willing to challenge my people. That's actually why I always begin with Trump, well, I always begin with Trump jokes, because people are surprised. And I only get to the Democratic jokes later. For example, of all the places Hillary Clinton could choose to live, she chose Chappaqua, New York. Do you know Chappaqua is Indian for separate bedrooms? <laughs> See, I waited till I'm 15 or 20 minutes into the presentation, or the fact that Bernie Sanders, <laughs> or the fact that Bernie Sanders knocked on 50 doors in one day trying to find the last undecided voters in Iowa. Hillary knocked on the same 50 doors. She was just trying to find Bill. <laughs> so I waited till I was deep into this, but. Hey, can I just ask you a quick follow-up on the alternative facts? What they do with alternative facts, though, is you gave three sources of facts. They'll just discredit the sources. So what do you do about that? It's your job to ensure that the source cannot be discredited. I'll give you an example. Anything that the Milken Institute puts out, people are gonna trust. So you cite it, you don't just take the information, you cite that it comes from the Milken Institute. Because there is no political bias here. You may disagree with it, but there is no political bias. I need to show you more. Give me one second, let me get through a few of these. So I'm gonna give you comparisons, because I'm actually trying to remove some language from your lexicon. I'm trying to, not only help you be more effective in the words that you use, I'm trying to take out words that you frankly should lose. And I'll go through a few of these. Accountability, everyone across the globe know what accountability means. But not everyone knows what transparency means. It is, it's, it's not something that we use in our day to day lexicon. It's something that many of you in this room talk about. But I will tell you that so many of your shareholders do not know the definition, or themselves don't have a definition of transparency, but everyone has a definition of accountability. Making tough choices, big deal. That is what adults have to do every single day. If you're sitting there saying, I'm making tough choices, it doesn't matter. In fact, people will get angry that you're trying to get credit for something that doesn't really matter to them. You're setting priorities, Actually, I started to admit a mistake. I want to go back to that. I used to think that Americans wanted to know your values, your principles, and they do. But even more importantly than principles, they want to know your priorities. Your principles are about why you do what you do, but your priorities tell them what you're going to do. It's much more specific, it's much more impactful, and it's something that the public desperately wants to know. So for those of you who have any kind of communication strategy, you need to tell them your priorities. Two more from up here. Human capital. Can everybody repeat the words human capital? <laughs> One more time, louder. I hate you all. <laughs> if you say those words again, I will come and punish you. And it's said in this conference all the time. Human capital means that you're putting a price tag on the people who work for you. Human capital means that you're putting a dollar sign on your people. You think it sounds great because it's an economic term and allows you to measure the impact of human beings. Stop doing it because to them it means that you're just a profit center rather than a human being. I'm going to show you momentarily just how bad the system of capitalism is perceived right now. And in fact, one of the words I'm trying to pull out of your lexicon is capitalism. But let's start with human beings. They don't want to be a dollar sign. They want to be respected. 
and appreciated for who they are. Human talent, not human capital. And one more, everyone wins through this whole win-win thing. Winning? No. If you follow sports, there are virtually no ties except for hockey and soccer, or football for those of you from other countries. You don't tie, there's a winner and a loser. Everyone can benefit, but not everyone wins. So I want you to have the credibility of your language so that people trust you. And too often you're saying words that turn people off. Again, a question here. Right there. Hold on, let the microphone get to you. Uh, the word commitment, I find, especially in higher education, we're committed to this, we're committed to that. To me, it's wishy-washy. Why don't you just say, we will or we are doing Every activity can have a commitment. Whether you follow through is another thing. That's, a, that's an excellent point. And the reason why commitment came into the lexicon is because people were making promises and pledges. And the only people who make promises and pledges are used car salesmen and politicians. And so we had to get that out. And by the way, committed. Now, I'm going to say to you, you're correct with the word committed. Because bless you. She's, she's allergic to the word committed over here. <laughs> committed doesn't mean as much. Commitment is your reputation. If I make a commitment to change how you communicate over the next 60 minutes, you're going to judge me by whether I did or didn't. And if I say the word commitment, I'm going to raise the bar on what I have to teach you and you're going to raise the bar on what you want to learn. And if I succeed, I'll be rewarded as you walk out. And if I fail, you'll never attend another one of my sessions. I can't say I will, because you don't know me. And you, you may, that may be my intention. But if I say to you, my commitment is to make you a better communicator, I'm showing you that I'm serious. And you'll be able to judge me for that. By the way, and, and here's one of the things, because people argue with me over words. I have done 25 years of testing. I am as fat as I am because I am never outside, because all I do is figure out what words work. And if I ever walk up to you in a restaurant and ask you a question, don't throw water on me, just answer it. I had one of these, one of these times, this really did happen. They were a family of five, three kids, two parents, and all five of them were on their phones. And I'd not seen this. And I just had to go up and ask, is this what happens at every meal? The kids knew what I was doing. Dad knew what I was doing. And mom was pissed at me. Because I was showing that she wasn't a great mom. By the way, you, um, as you see people, there are still three, there are still four seats in the front section. I know we're filled up back there. I'm always doing these experiments. Trust me. My commitment to you is never to give you a word that fails. That's the best way I can do it. Right here. Go ahead. Well, I hear you. OK, I do my language here. <laughs> um, we have still elect presidents by the Electoral College. And um, when I listen to you on television, you talk about um, presidential popularity polls. I assume those are nationwide polls. Yes. Why do you do that? Why don't we just do 50 of them and add up the electoral college votes in each one? Because that's going to be a far better indicator of the outcome of the election. Because news organizations cannot afford to take national polls. Now you want them to take 50 state polls? They can't afford it? Absolutely not. A typical national poll, I don't know what political pays, but a typical national poll is probably $25,000, $30,000 if you're doing it for the press. When I do my corporate stuff, a nationwide survey, I'm close to 100 k now, if I'm doing it for the media, they don't pay as much. The profit margins are lower. But if I'm going to do a $30,000 poll times 50 states, they're not going to do it. It just doesn't happen. And by the way, the nationwide polling with, with uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, the nationwide polling was accurate. It was the state-by-state -state polling that wasn't. Let me do a few of these here. I'm going to get through all of these before the session ends. Why freedom over liberty? In fact, let's do it one, one quick test. Who here prefers freedom? Raise your hands. Who here prefers liberty? Raise your hands. Almost always the people who prefer liberty are Republican conservative. It's ideological. And people didn't realize that. 
L freedom is how I feel and what I want. Liberty is making a statement. And if you're trying to speak across the aisle, you'll be far more effective talking about freedom than you will something that's polarizing as liberty is. Another one of these, which I find interesting. Instead of ending government waste, I'm sorry, instead of balancing the budget, for those of you who do policy, balancing the budget is all about process. Ending government waste is all about results. Whenever you can, you always want to talk about the impact of what you're doing. And by the way, even the word impact is more powerful than, uh, than change. Balancing the budget is a process. Ending government weight is, waste is the impact. Let me do another one for you. Right now, 38% of Americans think socialism is better than capitalism. And that number is climbing and climbing every single day. And it is not just from 18 to 29 year olds. There's now a considerable percentage of 30 to 39 and even people in their 40s who prefer socialism. And it's not that they like socialism, it's that they don't like capitalism. And in fact, one of the problems is that they don't even know what socialism means. All they know is that they get free education, free health care, free job training, free shit. And I was waiting for Bernie Sanders to put up signs all over. And by the way, I think he could be the nominee. If you ask me to say right now who I think will be the, the candidates in 2020, I think it'll be Donald Trump versus Bernie Sanders. And that will be, I just heard, oh God, from, from down there, by the way. Hey, if you guys are going to heckle, then you've got to sit up with the audience, not, not down there. Uh, and it will be a fascinating campaign because it will be a campaign about who we are as a country and we are, where we are going economically. Um, I have a better phrase than free enterprise system. I did not change this slide, I should have. Economic freedom is a far better way to communicate capitalism than capitalism itself. And when you hear the word capitalism, people think Wall Street, they think greed, they think a rigged system. But when you hear the phrase economic freedom, you think Main Street small business, opportunity. Capitalism is about those of you who are from Fortune 500 companies. Economic freedom is about the rest of us. And if you in this room, because I know most of you are on this side of capitalism, if you don't want to see the whole system destroyed, you will change your lexicon now. I know that, um, um, uh, shoot. He spoke, uh, Milken inter uh, interviewed him yesterday. I've drawn a blank. Ken Griffin. I know Ken challenged Mike. All of you should challenge Mike. All of you should challenge others. I am, I, I am nonpartisan and I'm nonpolitical, but I am absolutely pro economic freedom. And I don't want to see the system destroyed. And you're perpetrating the slow, steady destruction of that opportunity if you continue to demonize it by the language that you use. Again, I'll open it up right there. Hold, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Economic freedom sounds awfully nebulous. And why not opportunity? I mean, I, did, you, did you research that? Is yes. So here's the problem with opportunity, is that actually economic freedom to people is more specific. Opportunity says to them that they may or may not whatever. They have the opportunity, it may or may not. Economic freedom says that they can. To the average individual's ear, opportunity is much less clear. And economic freedom, because of freedom, says I have the right to. Doesn't mean I'll get it, but I have the right to. And by the way, the opposite of that is deny. So for those of you who do believe in economic freedom, what does socialism deny? Because when you tell someone they're denied, they had the right to it, but you denied it to them. One more. I will continue. Oh, over here. Uh, capitalism versus socialism. Why isn't there more of a focus by candidates on picking the best of both and pointing out some of the socialist things we already have in society, like public parks and military and things like that? Uh, that's what many candidates on the Democratic side have refused to make that choice. 
And the reason why we're having this discussion, actually, Congresswoman AOC, more than any other person in America, Donald Trump hasn't changed the policies, hasn't changed the thought process as much as AOC. We are having debates today that we never would have had before. And if I get to it, a clear majority of Americans want to raise taxes on the 1%. I'm going to do a test here, see how honest you guys are. Who here thinks you're part of the 1%? Raise your hands. OK, bullshit. This whole group right here says they're not. I've seen your income statement, ma'am. <laughs> you're part of the one-tenth of 1%. One By the way, someone's breaking into your house right now to take photographs to prove that you really are part of the 1%. Nobody wants to be part of that. And she's demonized those people who do the best, create the jobs, engage in the economy. And it's not to say that there aren't people who do bad things, who are extremely wealthy. But the jobs created in America are not created by the people who are on the 60th percentile. They are created by the people on the first percentile. And my issue, yes, we should talk about the safety net. We should talk about those things to ensure that nobody falls below. But There's going to be a tax, if, there's going to be a, a wealth tax. If you make more than $10 million a year, 60% of Americans want to raise taxes on those who have more, I'm sorry, have more than $10 million in assets. There is now an attack on the successful, and this language is meant to defend the successful. It isn't meant to defend socialism, but it is meant to defend opportunity and success and economic freedom. Let me, keep, let me do a few more here. Job or career? Again, by a show of hands, I'll come to you next. Job or career? Who here would rather have a job? Raise your hands. Who'd rather have a career? Raise your hands. So then why are these politicians talking about jobs all the time? If everybody wants to have a career, and the difference is about 20%, the whole conversation is about jobs, jobs, jobs. We have an unemployment rate that's at historic lows. People don't want the nine to five. They want something they can't wait to go to. They don't want something that they're actually looking at their watch when it's done. They want to be excited about it. My judgment of whether I succeed is if I can keep you off your phones, if I can make eye contact with you and you're actually paying attention. That's my success. So I failed with you, but I'm doing pretty well with everybody else in this section. <laughs> A job, you're checking your watch and you're looking at your phone. A career, there's no reason to pull it out of your pocket because you are so excited that you're engaged and it doesn't matter who's calling you. That's the difference and the politicians get that wrong. One more up here. Particularly, anyone here in healthcare, raise your hands if you do anything with healthcare. Okay, if you have the word customized on your website, remove it. Customized is all about, I've customized it, it's profit. It's about finance. It, it's about numbers. If I personalize my health care, I'm delivering it to each individual here. If I've customized it, I'm looking at how I can make more money from it. Let me show you one more, and then I'm going to you over there. Do I have any CEOs in this room? Raise your hands. It's funny, the CEOs are actually in the back of the room, not the front of the room. When the public hears the word CEO, they think profit margin, they think bottom line, they think profits over people. When you hear business leader, I'm the leader of the company, they think someone who is the most important value you can have as a CEO, a problem solver. I am constantly rewriting annual report letters. And by the way, that's not even a letter anymore because that's a formality. It's a communication, it's a discussion. Best thing of all is conversation. If you're a CEO, you need to have a conversation with your shareholders, not a letter to them, it's a conversation with them. And as CEO, I want them to think of you as a human being, not the person that fires people if the numbers go bad. A Couple more up here. Corporation, once again, it's about money, it's a profit center. Employers and employees, is bringing people together and putting them on the same side, which has not happened enough in the country today. Last one from this set, 
please start using the word performance and not the word profit, particularly those of you whose income is dependent on your communication. I made a good profit, therefore I can get a good dividend. If it's about performance, it's taking into account all aspects of what a business does. If it's about profit, then they wonder, did you do it on the backs of your people or on the backs of your consumers? People will allow you to make a lot of money if you are communicating that you have provided performance. They will resent you if you're communicating profit. Go ahead, there's a question over here or comment. Okay, so she's one of my favorite people. Thank you very much. I, you're a great person too, Frank. But to attack AOC for attacking the, the uh, one percent, as you know, when I grew up, the remax rate was uh, ninety percent on my family. And as you know, we've done pretty well by giving back to the country. So I don't think you can just attack her for that because we did go through a time in our country, and my family's done very well despite the high taxes. But the problem is that she's. She is demonized. I'm going to use that word. She's demonized the 1%. So we can do it without demonizing it and say we can have, as Milliken did very well yesterday, said we can have shared prosperity. And I think that that's a better way of saying it. We don't have to demonize, but to say how do we create shared prosperity is a nicer way of putting it, and one which is you agree, I agree, and I think my grandfather, who did quite well, would also agree. So that's, that's the challenge, is that I feel that she's demonized the people who are in this room and demonized uh, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. She just asked what your name was. And by the way, if that's your phone ring, you really need to change it. <laughs> the problem is that we are demonizing way too many people. And that, I don't and that I don't believe that people in this room, I really believe that people in this room, for the most part, have earned it. And I believe that people in this room, for the most part, not only are good or decent people, but they give back. This institute, and particularly the people down there who don't want to sit up with the people up here, this reminds me of the song One Tin Soldier. You're the mountain people and you're the valley people. And I will tell you that the mountain people kill the valley people. <laughs> Just remember how the song ends. There is way too much demonization. And I think it has to stop. And by the way, I'm really afraid because what they are doing is they're teaching the next generation to re not just to reject, but to dehumanize, and the worst of all, to delegitimize. And we need to tone it down. Yes, sir, someone's gonna have to run to him because I can't get there. You know, if you say, that, my name's Ken Kilroy, I'm from Los Angeles. Um, if you repeat the same thing over and over again, it becomes true. The tax rate 40 years ago was 90%, but there was a 50% capital gains deduction. Nobody in the Kennedy family paid more than 45% tax. Okay, we're not going to do that. I, I apologize for that. That's not helpful to the Congress. But that's the point. It's not about a specific family. It's not about a state. It's about all of us. My greatest fear, and I was going to do this at the very end, is that we are now doing identity politics, and it is awful. We judge people by what gender we are, or by what ethnicity we are, rather than what we actually do. We should be judged by our ideas and our track record, our success, not just our intent, but our results, not by how we look. And certainly not by, in my mind, one of the greatest families in my lifetime in this country. I know them, and they have done so much, and they continue to do, and I'm actually, you wouldn't even know this, but I'm part of one of the branches. I'm working with them now to bring down the level of anger and the level of distrust. And it's a privilege to work with them. In the I apologize, the gentleman who's back there, and then we're gonna do her, I'll get you the microphone. And I still gotta get through a few more slides. Yeah, Frank, thanks for coming today. Um, you actually just recently touched on identity politics, and I was curious, in your presentation, you haven't mentioned any of the racial identity politics that a lot of politicians have sex successfully used to kind of balkanize the current rhetoric. And I was curious if you could kind of talk about that and maybe the ways we can kind of tone down some of that rhetoric. By the way, I wish I had a picture. I would love to take a shot of all of you taking pictures of that, because as I've been going through this presentation, more and more people have been taking up their cameras. It looks really cool. If there was still a Life magazine, this would be a great shot. 
you have to blame the conservatives in the 1980s and 1990s for doing it because of their politics in places like North Carolina. It was clear what they were trying to do. They were trying to polarize. Now the racial politics, the racial card is being played by the left against the right as a way to turn out more African-American votes. And I will tell you that the impact of that is measurable in voter turnout, but it is also measurable in how divided and how ugly the politics have become. So that everything that is done to fight that is considered racist, and everything that is done to promote that and how it's portrayed is considered expanding the electorate or expanding democracy. And it is getting deeper and deeper. And you feel it in my focus groups that I do in Atlanta, I'll give you specific cities, in Atlanta and Chicago, those cities are on edge. And I don't know how to prevent it because it works. If you want to just jigger up turnout, if you want to, to poke it so that you get a high percentage who are going to vote straight Democrat, it's the same thing that Republicans did in the 1980s. And it was wrong when the Republicans did it in the 80s, Jesse Helms, his campaigns, and it's wrong when it's done today. So both of them are a problem. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, you've been talking about um, uh, demonizing the wealthy and then we need to humanize the problem, but I'm, I'm more concerned about humanizing all the people that don't have generations of accumulated wealth, and, and I myself acknowledge my own privilege. I was able to go to college without having debt, and so you're commenting, oh, everyone works hard in this room, but you know, the diversity in this room is pretty abysmal, and I just wonder how we, what, what the messaging around the word privilege, which I'm sure doesn't go very well, but I am of a younger generation that's perfectly fine calling out my own privilege and trying to advocate for a mass part of our country that hasn't had that same benefit. And instead of using the word privilege, I use the word responsibility. And this is very much a Marxist point of view. To those who have been given a lot, much is expected. If we have the advantages that you have in your family, then you owe the society and those who haven't those advantages, you owe them your work, you owe them your efforts, you owe them to reach out so that they too have the same opportunities that you have. So it's about responsibility and it is about intergenerational improvement. So I get that, but a better way than talking about privilege is to talk about personal responsibility. I want to do one on climate change because I have a reputation of being involved in this and it is true from 20 years ago. And I speak about this now because it is clear that something really bad is happening. You cannot deny it. And this is a frustration that I have with some people from my side of the aisle. I, I saw the fires coming down the 405 and they were approaching my house. And I saw what happened the year after that and the year after that. I see the strength of these storms, the, 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 how ferocious they've become. But here's the challenge for you guys who are, are trying to get legislation on climate change. Sustainability is the status quo. If you say we want a sustainable policy, all that means is that ocean is exactly the same 20 years from now as it is today. That the hike, that the mountain, that the lake, sustainability, you are sustaining it for the next generation. And I want you to do better. If I want to get environmental legislation as a much higher priority, and I blame a lot of the environmental groups for this, because I could show you the list, and environmental policy is almost at the bottom in terms of American priorities. What they want is cleaner, cleaner, safer, healthier. They want genuine improvements. If you really want to raise environment, you have to show them that we're going to do better than we're doing right now. And that is very much a frustration for me, and one more from this list, and then I'm going to have, actually, if my guys are here and want to do this, it's not diversity. Diversity means I'm going to take two people from this section, two from that section, two from here, and two from there. And none from there, by the way. Wow, they're actually paying attention. Um, inclusion means it's all of us. You're all promoting diversity policies in what you do. You realize that you're actually offending some people in promoting these policies, but inclusion is like a big hug. Inclusion is all of us, so that everyone gets re represented, not just those who are born with a little extra money or born in a nicer place. Inclusion is all of us. Uh, my NYU 
uh, students, where are you? Come on up. You need to move very quickly because I only got five minutes to go. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm a pessimist, and I am. If you heard what I heard, you'd be that way too. Can we get the microphones come up here too so I can hand them two of them? Every focus group that I do, it's uglier. Every focus that I, group that I do, people are meaner. And it really bothers me. Do we have one more mic for This is the antidote. And I'm gonna try to do this without getting emotional because there is something special in the next generation. There is something special when they actually live together and play together and eat together and study together and plan together. Please introduce yourselves and what country you're from. My name is Martin from Colombia. I'm James from New Zealand. I'm Dokan from Turkey. Uh, I am Yero. I'm from Senegal. In NYU Abu Dhabi, you have Russians and Ukrainians that are not only roommates, but they are friends, as their parents are in the process of killing each other. China and Vietnamese students, the one that is my most favorite, because I watched it in my class, the, the Indian and Pakistani dispute is hot, and it's getting dangerous. And the two students were genuinely best friends, and they acknowledged that their parents would have hated it. But you have Indian and Pakistani students who genuinely love each other. But here's what's interesting, because I don't know what they're going to say. None of them are on the right. They're all somewhere on the left, some of them further left than others, in a broad sense. What is your reaction to the last five days? What do you think of them? <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, is there anything specific? No, I'm going to let you answer it any way you want to. No leads, capitalism, socialism. I okay, um, the, the, the Turkish guy will answer anything for anyone at any time. <laughs> I'm going to let him go first, and then you, I'm coming back to okay. you. Okay. Um, I met amazing people. I, I met the maestros of problem solvers uh, in many of the sectors I really care about, especially artificial intelligence, because I'm a computer engineer. Uh, I just could not believe that I actually got to meet uh, people who are behind. But what do you think of them? You've been, you, you're not such a capitalist. What do you think of them? I think these are the people who actually open, open gates for people who are actually smart. And I think we, there's a need for people in that layer. And I have no problem with that. No problem. Notice that's his, <laughs> that's his positive. He's got no problem with you. Martin. What I see is a lot of motivation for change. Contrary to all the professors that I surround myself on a day-to-day -day basis being at a university, I have surrounded myself here with a lot of people that are very optimistic, contrary to what Frank believes, and I believe that that optimism is great, and there's reason for it. Are they the answer, or are they the problem? I have a question. Um, how many people here, because um, I know there's a lot of important people, um, a lot of people who are top executives, at the different things that they do. How many people here would agree that if you are the CEO or one of the top executives in your company, you should earn a much disproportionately higher amount than one of your uh, lowest ranked employees? Let's say you earn about 20 to 30 times more than your lowest pay employee. How many people would agree that a CEO should be, should be able to earn that much? disagree with that. By the way, I'm a pollster. You're taking my job here. I, no, I, I, need, some, I need some ground to work from. Um, so, we gotta move. I'm, I'm an economist, um, so I study economics, and one of the most famous, um, some of the most famous economists do write often about top marginal income taxation rates and how um, that can have an impact on raising money and potentially uh, benefiting the larger public at large. But, now, what, do you, but what do you think of them? Because I need... I, if I, understand, I understand. J um, James wants to go, so... Very simply, very simply. I don't think I would have ever the opportunity to be in such a space of, of, of people who are such achieved individuals if it was not through 
you and, no. and basically <laughs> Mac Milker. And so, and so very simply, um, I think capitalism is right in some aspects, but then also getting um, access to things like free education, um, getting um, things like basic health care for everyone, uh, getting things like social, basic social needs are things that have to happen in society. I was not born in a privileged environment, and this is not a place I should, I would, I, I would, I would have been in. Was it not for opportunities that were open to me? And so I believe that a country should definitely have opportunities for young people, regardless of the environment they were, they were born in. You guys agree with that, I assume? One more. He and I argue more than, than all of them combined. The conference is over today. What do you think of them? Um, so first of all, thanks everyone for having me. Um, what I've seen over the last few days is that everyone in this room um, feels like they have something to contribute towards shared prosperity. And that's really positive and, and seeing that has changed my mind on a lot of different things. But what still concerns me and what I still see day in, day out, um, we also had a, a conversation um, over politics with, with, with Frank last night. Um, I've noticed the people in this country divide themselves because it's easy to do. And when we talk about socialism and capitalism, this country will never be a socialist country. And policies like socialized healthcare, to other countries, they're not socialism, that's just good social policy. And this country can be a strong capitalist country, and it doesn't have to, it, it can engage with these policies and not be socialism. But you're arguing with each other and calling each other socialists instead of thinking about what's progressive and what maybe can further this country in terms of social policy. And, and what I've seen is this desire to divide by these terms. No one's a socialist really in this country. A very, very small proportion of people are. And those terms need to change. And And now you know why I have faith and hope. This is happening at NYU Abu Dhabi. It's not happening in many college campuses across the globe. These guys are amazing. And if they are the direction for the future, we're going to have a really good future. Thank you very much for coming. Have a good rest of the conference.